Alrighty, I'm going to talk about high friction surfacing. It seems to be kind of the, the wave across the United States that everybody seems to be involved in in some capacity. We, we have some experience with WashDOT, uh, not a whole lot, but we've learned a lot in the process. I think in the last oh, six, seven years, I think we have about eight jobs that we've done, and some of them performed really good, and some of them performed really bad. So we're, we're just trying, we've narrowed down what seems to work for us, and I just want to share our experience and uh, what we've done to hopefully improve performance in the future. So I'm not going to go into a lot of the nuts and bolts of high friction surfacing. I'm just mostly going to talk about our, our performance, experience, whatnot. But I'll just get a few introductory slides of showing you what high friction surfacing is, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's gained popularity over the United States in the last several years. Uh, basically reduce accidents, run off the road in horizontal curves with heavy braking, um, run off the road accidents. Uh, there's been a lot of jurisdictions that we know have been using high friction surfacing. And we know that um, uh, in many states, that nine for sure, um, that have gone really uh, heavy into using in, uh, high friction surfacing uh, in their network system, in their highway system. Uh, they aggressively deploy and, and use it uh, a lot. You can't lie that many of the states that have used this or other jurisdictions, it has reduced accidents. It, it does uh, work and it does... Uh, uh, save lives. So you can't argue with that. Basically, high friction servicing is a durable, uh, polish resistant aggregate uh, applied to existing surface. Most commonly, or the exclusive use, it uses an a aggregate called uh, calcine bauxite um, with an epoxy resin. This, this bauxite comes from China and it's written specifically in the Astro spec, which most uh, jurisdictions use. And it's the, the uh, primary use that is used in high friction surfacing. There's a lot of questions about the use of uh, boxing, uh, calcium bauxite, whether there's other applications, other aggregates can use. I know NCAT just finished a report and it, it showed the performance of other type of aggregates that perform uh, very well. So maybe in the future there might be more applications of these other aggregates, but right now uh, the astro spec is very specific to the calcium bauxite. So it's uh, in a lot of cases it's hard to change that spec and allow the use of these other products. And there's, like I said, there's usually a gener uh, generally very high cost, uh, benefit cost ratio that it's very effective, does save lives. The friction numbers that we see are great, generally from the get-go are uh, greater than 70. Uh, normal roadways in Washington, um, asphalt roadways, we see friction numbers in the 40s and 50s and to jump to 70 is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty big jump. There's different ways uh, the high friction surface goes down. There's uh, one of them is a mechanical plate placement where the uh, epoxy resin is just sprayed on the roadway followed by the uh, um, application of the aggregate. Uh, it's pretty much all done mechanical. There's also a mechanical plus manual placement kind of a combination of the two where the binder is basically sprayed on the roadway and it, lots of times it's squeegeed around to get all the voids and crevices and then followed by uh, the application, in this case, it's like a uh, spreader, uh, just spreading sand down on, on the surface, just covering it up, um, letting it absorb in and uh, uh, broom off what's, what is excess. Then, of course, there's the hand placement, which is basically the, the hand mixing of the, of the epoxy resin, uh, the, the uh, placement basically squeegee on the road, then uh, basically comes down to just throwing sand on, or the boxing, um, calcium bauxite aggregate on the, on the roadway surface. So within WashDOT, like I said, we've done a few jobs. We started back in 2010, a project on SR-14, which is uh, along the Columbia River on the southern uh, border of our state. I just threw in one job we were involved with, uh, working with Thurston County on a Bald Hills Road job. Uh, there's been other jobs, 2015, 2016. We basically have plans for about 13 more jobs in the next two to three years. So it, it's, there, there will be more jobs in Washington State going out, but we learned a lot from the initial jobs that we placed and just watching the performance of these and um, learning what we could to improve the process in the future. So I'm just going to show you some photos of uh, some of these jobs. There is the good and the ugly. I thought I had more of the ugly, but I couldn't find the photos I needed at the time of this presentation. But let me start what, show you what I have here. SR-14, this is three years after placement where we started to see some delamination in, in the surface. Uh, this is what it is six years later you know, throughout the section, and it's progressed significantly beyond this. This is common of what other states have seen. They see the, the good, bad, and ugly, and this is uh, 
ugly where the delamination is uh, uh, very present on the roadway. The roadway is still functional, but we find a lot of times that people start avoiding the distress and kind of uh, go wide around it and other things to avoid the, the, the potholing effect. Uh, it's really functional, um, but it just uh, aesthetically it's not pleasing at all. This is a Bald Hills Road job, and I talked to some of the Thurston County folks yesterday, and they, their assessment was overall it's done pretty well. There, there are some areas that uh, do not look good for one reason or another. The, the moisture you see on the road is from the skid testing that we do on these, these sections. So just an area of rich um, um, surface without any aggregate on the surface. Additionally, there's, there's cracking developing in the roadway. You can see the cracking. This is two years after placement. These have uh, increased significantly. Uh, beyond that today. So this was taken in uh, 2016. Uh, then uh, you can see the cracking appearing through the high friction surfacing, uh, just the typical cracks that we see. And a lot of times you start raveling and you get the distress and it just keeps growing from there. This is SR 526, a ramp uh, not too far from here. Uh, there's longitudinal cracking present throughout the project limits. It's hard to see, but there are cracks in this roadway and our, our guess is it's going to continue to deteriorate. Uh, to the point it's going to need some kind of maintenance activity. You can see uh, it's not a, not a cure for uh, accidents. You can see the uh, white paint marks on it that they still get accidents on even high friction surfacing. So it's not a cure all by any means. Then 148th Street, it's a ramp to I-90 westbound. There's cracking showed up. And this was just only nine months after placement. And uh, these are going to continue to grow and um, eventually work in delamination, just the other problems that we see with high friction surface, just the long-term performance. The same ramp, just some of the potholes. This is uh, nine months after construction and uh, it's grown since this point. But early on, we were just concerned about, we were putting high friction surfacing down, you're expecting a, a reasonable surface life. And then we were seeing the stress occur right away. So we started asking these questions within WashDOT. Um, we started wondering about the raveling and roadway surface prior to installation. installation. How much can it tolerate before you place a high friction surfacing uh, the existing longitudinal joints were reflecting through. So what, what is the limit of the cracking that you can have on existing roadway? Uh, existing cracks, you deteriorate after placement of high friction stream. How do you slow that down? Or you try to put on a roadway that's in uh, great shape so you don't have any existing cracking when you put it down. Low density areas of HMA uh, causing distress or pop outs. Uh, surface tension difference between HMA and the resin compound. You have the stiff resin compound and the flexible pavement layer uh, below it, so they're, they're not compatible with each other, and uh, is that contributing to the stress? And uh, I also mentioned there are alter materials rather than the bauxite that be effective, and uh, the NCAT study seems to show that um, this is so. We started to put all these things in perspective of the stresses we were seeing, and the slated for uh, many more projects in, with WashDOT, and pre also a, a huge amount of projects with the local agencies have also done a significant amount of high friction surfacing at this point, and, and they've seen a lot of the same distresses. And um, I think they're going to be su surprised at how poorly some of these are going to perform on them. So I, I kind of equate it to our, um, we had some roadways in uh, uh, our state, north central region, where the r roughness was so bad that we needed to do some kind of reconstruction, which we did. And the right fix for this road would have been a uh, chip seal. Uh, just a double shot chip seal would have been fine, all this road needed. But unfortunately, this roadway had a history, a long history of having rebel strips in the existing pavement section. And uh, because precedents had been sil built, we were not allowed to uh, just do the simple chip seal because it needed rumble strips. And how do you put rumble strips in a brand new chip seal without making a zipper down the roadway? So you kind of locked in what's happening. We kind of equate that to the high friction surfacing that we start using these products and are we going to be locked in to performance expectations that in the long term, who, are we going to have to come back every time this needs to be resurfaced and put another high friction surfacing down at whose expense and how do you work this into your preservation program when funds are already stretched um, uh, tight enough? So those are some of the questions that we're driving our our uh, uh, questions here in Washtenaw, and ironically, I was just looking at some email prior to coming up here, and I, um, our our uh, county road administration board, they are putting out this kind of a position paper and just some guidance on high friction surfacing, and one of their uh, conclusions was um, it needs to be the right location, the right condition, the right treatment, uh, 
There needs to be tougher screening criteria should be considered. Uh, you need to realize the short-term and long-term costs associated with uh, high friction surfacing and also the addition of performance monitoring and find out what you're getting out of it long-term and how it's performing. So um, it seems like the cities and counties and locals are just uh, coming, tracking with WashDOT and the things we're experiencing as we push ahead. WashDOT, oh, it was about a year, well, a year ago, almost over a year ago now, that we sat down, we had different groups in our DOT. We had the uh, CPDM, that's our money folks. Uh, development, we had traffic, we had materials, we had uh, construction, and we sat down, put our heads together, and we put together some criteria for the use of high friction surfacing in Washington State, and that's what I'm gonna share now. And basically, um, it's just some simple steps that uh, we do to screen roadways for high friction surfacing. And number one, the high friction surfacing roadway uh, should be placed on a pavement that is in relatively good shape. And we, we picked a number of five years or less that the, there's uh, very little, if any, distress on the highway. And we put it on a roadway where there's no structure-related cracking or rutting, no age-related alligator or longitudinal cracking. Transverse cracking is okay, provided the, the, the cracks are not raveled, and uh, no cracks greater than the quarter inch in width. So uh, that's our number one criteria that we consider for high friction surfacing. It needs to be a newer road, something that's gonna uh, we know is going to perform well. High friction should not be placed over longitudinal joints in the wheel paths. The maximum rut depth should be less than a quarter inch. At least 75% of the site should be less than an eighth of an inch. No raveling, flushing, or evidence of stripping. Uh, no drainage problems that result in water on the pavement surface during dry periods and must have sufficient surface texture for a good bond. So I think by including these things, we're going to uh, hopefully ensure good performance of this uh, product that uh, certainly in the right place, the right application um, is, is a good product and will save lives. One of the things that we were doing in WashDOT is uh, friction performance. Another thing we do on every high friction job is we, we go back once a year and measure the friction and just see where we are. And you can see on this job on 148, the, the baseline friction before the treatment was like a 38. And the initial high friction surfacing uh, was about a 74 and a half. And it's, it, this one's doing pretty well. Today it's about 70, 71, 72 on the, on the friction number. Uh, in Everett, a uh, little different. We started, initial was 38.7. Uh, the, the construction was 82, 83. And today, uh, two years later, we're down to uh, 67. So the, the, there is a decline in the performance curve, but I'm not aware of people really monitoring high friction surface and see where you're gonna end up. So um, we do have some experience on bridge decks in Washington, and um, they start a very similar process, epoxy with the resins or the uh, uh, high uh, quality aggregates put on the decks. And in short time, we were down to resin. They didn't wear very well at all. So our bridge department is not a huge advocate of using high friction surfacing just because of their the in-house uh, experience that we have seen. So I don't know where it's going to go with high friction surfacing, but we are monitoring it and we hope to report back in time. Here's some more results. This was uh, on 405, not too far from here, over in Bellevue. Uh, the initial friction was 37.1. year later, we're already down to a 70. We were 84, it jumped from 84 at time of construction, just following down to about a 70. So we've, we've lost some friction already. And finally, a job up in Linwood, just north of Seattle here, about 10 miles. Started, uh, initial uh, friction was 39. The initial construction was about 82, went down to 63. So it'll be interesting to follow these numbers over time and see exactly where, uh, where we end up. But like I say, you know, there's no doubt in the right application, uh, if done right, if done right, it, uh, drastically decreases the uh, accidents, uh, the you know, horizontal curve, run off the road accident, wet weather. And you can see uh, there's two jobs here. Um, one of them is I-90 westbound. And you can see six year average uh, was for all collisions was 17. And for the period that we looked uh, July, December, um, just on this first year, we were only down to one accident. Uh, the wet surface collisions were, uh, there was like 15.2, and still haven't seen any there yet. So there has been a reduction. On 526, you can also see a, a significant decrease in accidents. So, you know, it's interesting. The pavement office was kind of uh, 
saying, oh, you guys are killing this program, you know, because when you work with traffic folks, anything to do with safety sells. And uh, they did not like us getting in the way of their high friction program, but I think we're doing the right thing. Just help, help them in the long run get high friction servicing on the right road um, and see the, the right treatment at the right time, the right conditions so we can ensure long-term performance. We have some criteria for maintenance of high friction servicing, the cracking, what to do with the delamination, potholes. Um, we don't know if this is right, but as a starting place, it gives maintenance something they could put their arms around. If they see these distresses, they can go out and do something about it. For instance, delamination, if there's a small area, five feet by 10 feet, we're probably not gonna do anything with it. Uh, we could probably live with it, but if it starts getting bigger, we're probably gonna uh, patch with like materials and do something by hand and see if we can uh, help stretch out the life of the roadway. Uh, same thing with potholes. Small areas, you're probably not a big deal, as uh, long as they aren't too deep, but larger areas, um, we need to do something and might mean even patching with asphalt materials. Some of the unknowns, uh, can it be recycled? Um, it's small quantities, but that's unknown. Are the material properties relevant to HMA production? Are there environmental factors need to be considered? Precedence in using high friction surfacing once placed, is it always placed? And the big question that we had, Dave, Laura and I, we get involved, a lot of, have, have a lot of say in the, uh, uh, the preservation funds and how they're spent and who pays for the treatments behind, uh, between HMA and rehab cycles. So we've come to the uh, uh, guidance at this point that if the initial construction goes down, a lot of these are being funded by grants and other things. So, you know, so at this point, we haven't had a out, whole lot of outlay and, and the, the construction has gone down. But in the future, we'll probably pay for those, uh, the traffic office, whoever, whoever is interested in the treatment will put it down. But if it fails, if it needs another treatment in five, six years, then uh, it's gonna come out of uh, the traffic office, we'll pay for those, whoever uh, requested to put the high friction surface down in the first place. If it happens to coincide, if it does well, and it, uh, there's a rehab project that's gonna occur on the project of mill and fill, then the preservation program will absorb those costs. So we're just kind of spreading who pays for these. But the most important thing, we're gonna continue to monitor them, uh, do our maintenance repairs, and hopefully provide some good guidance in the future so we can uh, get the best uh, buy out of using high friction surfacing in Washington State. So I don't know if you, you other, everybody else who's used it, have you had the similar questions? Um, I know there's a lot of cities and county locals that have received grant money and not much thought has gone into where these are placed. It's kind of, okay, let's go put a high friction surfacing down. This is a good spot and away they go, but they're not considering the long-term um, and short-term costs associated with doing this or the long-term performance, so. So two questions, Jeff. Um, have you seen any difference in the distresses that are occurring from the different application methods? Is the mechanical process better than the manual or vice versa? And the second question is, have you seen the cost of these come down? I, I'm guessing you're paying about $28 a square yard or something like that for the <laughs> For the treatment, is that uh, is there hope of that coming I'll, down? I'll address the cost first. No, we haven't seen a reduction in cost by any means. We're probably playing in the $40 to $50 a square yard. And as far as performance of the different processes, I don't think we have enough down to really make a assessment. I know on our first job, they put it down, and it didn't turn out very well at all. The contractor uh, came back and put a second coat on top of it. And uh, after about a year, uh, they were really interested in making this work in Washington. Um, they weren't pleased with the performance, how it was looking. They came back and put another coat on top of it. So they came back twice and did it. Um, so we don't have enough experience at this point to see how it's performing. Thank you. Jeff, I got two questions. Yep. And, and the first one is, did you run both ribbed and smooth friction You know that, tests? Larry. <laughs> we, we just have the rib in our state. Okay. Did yeah, you do didn't. different speeds or just the 40? I think they did different speed. I don't recall the specifics. Okay, that might be interesting to see how that speed yeah. gradient is. And the, you probably had this on your slide for um, the right pavement oh. in your, and I just missed it, but in your evaluation is cross slope. One of the considerations because if you got a hydroplane problem from a geometry issue, it may not be fixable with friction. That's and probably correct. That's and not that's... a high ma macro texture surface. So if you have that, it may not 
work well. So I, that's just part of the evaluation process where it makes sense. So. Okay. On bridge on bridge decks, they use epoxy asphalt. Have you tried any epoxy we, we asphalt haven't because it point. might be more flexible and it might adhere better to the existing asphalt? That's a good suggestion. So we got to look into that. I, no, I we haven't done that. I, I know uh, on all the orthotropic bridge decks, they've used a lot of epoxy asphalt, and it seems to last a long time. But it, friction is not a concern on that. But it might it might work uh, and be more flexible and not crack as much. That's a good suggestion. So, hi Jeff. I got a couple questions. The first one would be, what's the standard? What's the uh, two question? What's the standard practice surface preparation on the existing pavement? Number two would be, have you ever thinking about try that on concrete pavement? Um, as far as the standard practice, it's pretty much we've been using the astro spec. We get, get it clean. They haven't been shot blasting or anything like that. Just to get a very clean surface. Um, I haven't been too involved with the uh, actual construction of this at this point, so I really can't answer that. So I, get, I can certainly get any answer though because. Uh, we, we got people on our staff that actually was going to give this presentation, but he got tied up. So we, we've tried, our bridge office has reported they've tried, you know, similar type of things in the past and they didn't have good performance. Maybe the, the proxies have approved or uh, there's a different process involved with doing it on bridge checks or better guidance than we use in the past. But no, we haven't done bridge, uh, on concrete at this point. Have you uh, noticed any issues with snow plows doing any damage to it? You know, we've only really put one down in a snowplow area, and I don't think there's been any. Tim would, he drives it every day. What do you say, Tim? A uh, little bit, but uh, not a lot of, uh, it hasn't clouded off like some hard chip seals lost, and uh, it's holding up pretty well. It's been down, down two years, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. A quick question. Uh, what are the section lengths where you place these? Are they sh short sections, like half a mile section, or are you putting miles long? Oh, no, they haven't been miles long at any place. Maybe uh, you know, less than 1,000 feet, uh, okay. curves, um, 500 feet, just short areas where the accidents are prone. So I, I, there's been entire ramps that are done that might be, I don't know, are you familiar, Dave? It might be a couple thousand feet, if that, but yeah. nothing, nothing. You know, just, just where it's needed. We're not doing whole jobs from uh, just basic, trying to base it on the crash data where the crashes are and trying to keep it localized. And, and what test methods are you using to check the friction? That's you, Dave. I'm sorry, a ribbed uh, locked wheel skid trailer. I just have a comment. Idaho is, I think we're in the process of uh, letting some contracts to uh, do some of this stuff. And uh, we're going to be using some, some uh, material from Wyoming. Oh, good for you. Uh, I think they're they're trying to get it. We got some in and, and tested it, and it seems to work. And I don't know, kind of makes the bauxite people un unhappy. But we're trying to figure out something that's less than the cost of the other stuff. So, yeah, the cost is pretty high on these. So anything you do that less than the cost is a good deal. And we've looked in that Wyoming product too. It's just how do you specify it in at this point? So we're working on that. Yeah. So the concerns that I mentioned are, are you guys. And agencies out there seeing the same type of concerns at all, or is life just going on? So I'm just curious. And we have uh, seen all the concerns that you have mentioned. And uh, uh, right now, because it's not considered as a pavement preservation treatment, it's more of a safety treatment. Exactly. It has been moved towards our traffic operations folks. Okay. And so uh, that's where it's being dealt with. But many of the issues that you have pointed out um, have been looked at. And one of the main things we look at when we looked at high friction surface treatment is what is causing the problem in the first place. Like yep. uh, Lara, they were saying earlier, if water is ponding, that's not going to help. And the other fear with something like this has been if you fix it temporarily right now and there is a bigger problem, you'll be constantly coming and doing the same kind of treatment. So for example, if on a curve, the, uh, the uh, problem needs to be addressed by a curve correction it'll never happen. Okay. And so there are things like that that have to be taken into account. So you have to look at it on a, on a bigger picture than just like what's the instant fix for it. Okay. I agree totally. If anybody's interested in our policy paper we wrote, I got that available. So just get a hold of me and I could send you a copy of that. So good enough. The preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation.
More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.